Okay guys, what do you need to know before you start learning virtualization technologies like uh, VMware, vSphere or VMware NSX or VMware vSEN. So at first you have to understand these three concepts. The concept of a virtualization, uh, the concept of the cloud, <laughs> and the concept of a software defined anything or everything. So, these three concepts, they form the foundation for your knowledge and skills of these virtualization technologies. Right? Okay, we'll start with this virtualization concept. And, uh, of course, we need to be more precise. That's why I'm going to explain the compute virtualization technology. So, virtualization of computers. So, let's rephrase the question. So, we need to understand how does compute hypervisor work. Right? Exactly. In details. So, the common understanding of compute hypervisor's logic looks like this. So, they say that if you take a physical host with a set of physical hardware, right? and uh, install a compute hypervisor on top of this set of physical hardware. So this is my hypervisor. So in our example, the hypervisor mm. is, similar to, is similar to physical operating system that is installed on top of physical hardware. By the way, uh, we are talking about type 1 or bare metal hypervisors. Right? So, uh, the, the good examples of type 1 or bare metal hypervisors are ESXi from VMware, uh, KVM from Red Hat and um, Hyper-V from Microsoft. Uh, and by the way, we are not talking about type 2 hypervisors that uh, work on top of physical operating system like Oracle Virtual Box, like VMware Workstation, nothing like this, right? So type 1 Compute hypervisors only, right? Are going to be mentioned in our scenario. So, again, this is my physical host running a bare metal compute hypervisor, right? And the moment you install this bare metal compute hypervisor, this physical host becomes a virtualization host. like a computer to host virtual machines, right? A location for virtual machines. So, after installing this bare metal compute hypervisor, you are able to access its administrative console, right? And you can create a set of synthetic hardware. Right? 
a synthetic set of hardware. This synthetic set, set of hardware might be used to install a general purpose operating system. So, uh, when you install a, an operating system on this set of synthetic hardware, this operating system becomes a guest operating system. Right? And by the way, this guest operating system has no means to differentiate between physical set of hardware or set of physical hardware and a set of synthetic hardware, right? It's indistinguishable, right? At all. And by the way, this set of synthetic hardware, uh, basically it's uh, almost every part of this hardware is synthetic except for physical CPU core, right? So everything is synthetic here, except for the processor, right? Okay, and uh, since you are the administrator of this, compute hypervisor of this virtual agent host, you are allowed to create multiple sets of synthetic hardware. And uh, as you may already know, this combination of synthetic hardware and uh, guest operating system uh, comprises uh, something called a virtual machine. Right? So this is my virtual machine one, virtual machine two, etc. Right? And uh, again, all these virtual machines and uh, guest operating systems running within these virtual machines are running on in parallel, right? All these virtual machines are running on top of this virtualization host, right? And uh, at the same time, the hypervisor is running, right? And uh, each and every guest operating system thinks, sort of thinks, that it owns this set of hardware, right? And this set of hardware is real. And for all the remote entities, for example, like other applications running somewhere outside of this virtualization host, uh, these guest operating systems and guest applications running within these virtual machines are indistinguishable from um, the instances that uh, are running on a physical set of hardware, right? Okay. But again, you have to know more, right? So basically, you need to understand how does this compute hypervisor uh, provides uh, a non-interrupted shared access to a single set of physical hardware for each and every guest operating system, right? So, to explain the compute hypervisor's logic and behavior, we are going to simplify this virtualization host a bit. So, let's represent this uh, physical black box as, uh, as the simplest form of physical computer. So this simplest form of physical computer consists of a single CPU socket with a single CPU and a single uh, core Single CPU core. Single CPU core means that we have single arithmetical logical unit complemented with a single set of registers. And let's treat everything else within this physical black box as this input output subsystem. So, 
Random Access Memory, Network Subsystem, uh, Disks, right? Doesn't matter, right? We're just treating all of this as an input-output subsystem. And let's focus on this timeline that represents CPU time. So let's assume that we've configured this virtualization host with, uh, I don't know, several virtual machines. And all these virtual machines are configured to uh, automatically start with virtualization host, right? And then uh, we've, we've shut it down all of this, right? And everything is powered off at the start, right? So what happens? when you power on this virtualization host, right? So first of all, we know that this physical host is equipped with a certain chip and there's a code within this chip. And this, ch and this code is called a BIOS code, right? Basic input output system. So this single physical processor core starts executing BIOS instructions, right? So I would say that during this period of time, BIOS controls this whole physical black box since its code is being executed on a physical processor core, right? And by the way, single physical processor core means that uh, we can execute a single thread, single set, sorry, single set of instructions at a time. And this set of instructions is dedicated to a single entity, right? Like BIOS. Right? So BIOS, um, I don't know, executes a power on self test, right? And uh, by the end of this period, BIOS deliberately passes the physical processor core to our hypervisor. So it's something like, hey, physical processor core, on the next CPU cycle, start executing the code of hypervisor's loader. Right? I'm going to use an E6i hypervisor from VMware in our example. But basically, it doesn't matter. The behavior is the same for KVM or Hyper-V. So, the moment physical processor core stops executing BIOS instructions, right? it starts executing hypervisor's instructions, and vice versa. Right? So, I would say there's a, there's a good analogy. BIOS uh, lost its, its consciousness. BIOS instructions are no longer executed on the physical processor core, meaning that BIOS does not control this core anymore, right? Okay. Hypervisor awakes, and while its instructions are being executed on the physical processor core, <laughs> hypervisor uh, hypervisor um, checks the presence of hardware assisted virtualization so within our chipset for example if it's uh, Within our physical black box chipset, uh, we need a, the, we need the presence of a certain technology that's gonna assist our compute hypervisor in 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 performing its duties. For example, in Intel chipsets, this technology is called Intel Dash VT. In AMD chipsets, this technology is called AMD Dash V. Right. The idea of this 
hardware assisted virtualization is pretty simple. So somewhere within this physical processor core, there's a logical construct called a restricted commands list. that works as this if then statement. So if any entity is trying to execute a comment from this list of restricted comments, then there's an exception on the physical processor core that is uh, processed as go to handler. So in our case, ESXi, being a compute hypervisor, registers itself as a handler for this list of restricted commands. So whenever someone or anyone is trying to execute a command from this list, hypervisor must be awakened. In addition to registering itself as a handler, hypervisor fills this list of restricted comments with this set of comments. The first one, idle command. So basically, if um, a certain guest operating system um, and its code is being executed on a physical processor core, and this guest operating system is trying to execute an idle column. It's something like, hey, physical processor core, stop generating the heat. Stop consuming the electricity, right? <laughs> Just stop. So physical processor core, as a result of this comment, does not stop really, right? It just uh, goes to handler, and in our case, this handler is a 6 i hypervisor. So hypervisor is awakened. Next comment, input-output comment. We know for sure that this set of hardware is completely synthetic, except for the physical processor core. So basically, Every guest operating system's input-output must be intercepted and properly processed by, uh, by, uh, by compute hypervisor, right? So basically, every time guest operating system is trying to exit the physical processor core, trying to access its uh, synthetic random access memory, synthetic uh, network subsystem, synthetic disk subsystem, its input-output must be intercepted and properly processed by a hypervisor. So basically, this command, being a part of this list of restricted commands, guarantees this behavior. Right. But, you might say, okay, but what if guest operating system running on a physical processor core mm. does not issue this idle command or input-output command at all? Right? What happens next? Uh, hardware assisted virtualization guarantees that once per 30 or 50 milliseconds, physical processor core stops executing any set of instructions and uh, goes to handler. Right? So as a result, when you look at this diagram, we might say, okay, even if E6I hypervisor or compute hypervisor deliberately passes the physical processor core uh, to, for example, to guest operating system one, right? And then after passing this physical processor core to guest operating system one, uh, compute hypervisor loses its <laughs> consciousness of sort. It's guaranteed to be awakened every time guest operating system is issuing this idle command or input output command 
or at least once per 30 to 50 milliseconds. So for example, guest operating system one issues this idle command. So basically that means it, this guest operating system no longer needs a physical processor core, right? And, and uh, mm -hmm. wants, to <laughs> wants to leave this core deliberately, right? And switch to, to an idle state. No problem. Hypervisor is awakened. And now hypervisor might say, okay, who's next? Who wants to sit on a physical processor core, for example? This might be so, a guest operating system 2. Right? Or a different scenario. Guest operating system 1 being on a physical core right, is trying to, I don't know, to, to access its virtual hard drive. Right? So it issues, it generates um, a SCSI, SCSI command. Right? So this SCSI command being a part of input-output command right? uh, is intercepted and processed by handler. In our case, it's compute hypervisor. So instead of I don't know, writing a block of data uh, to a certain address on a non-existing SCSI target, right? Our compute hypervisor falsifies this command, right? And uh, this original block of data is written to a completely different uh, SCSI target that is represented by a re real physical drive, right? Okay. So after this input-output operation is completed, the results of this input-output operation are forwarded by a compute hypervisor back to a guest operating system. And the physical processor 4 continues to execute guest operating system instructions. Right? So, basically, for this guest operating system, this um, this uh, interruption, right, uh, is um, is not visible. So, guest operating system lives in a world where there was no interruption at all. It uh, experiences an uh, uninterrupted execution of its code, right? And of course, in our macro world, right? All these changes in uh, CPU context. So during this period of time, guest operating system one code. Um, was being executed on a physical processor core. During this period of time, uh, compute hypervisor's code was being executed on a physical processor core. Uh, so basically, we uh, in our macro world, this whole thing, this whole system, looks like uh, a multitasking system where all these entities are running in parallel. Right? So that's the essence of compute virtualization. Uh, you know, we, for some purpose, we need to rephrase, right, reformat this scenario. So we'll use some, we're going to use some different words to explain this whole mess. So. We might say that compute virtualization technology mentioned here basically allows you to, to do what? 
a generic compute virtualization technology allows you to to take a set of physical hardware a set of physical computers think about physical computers produced by different vendors HP, Dell, IBM doesn't matter right? so all these uh, variations in physical compute hardware so as long as we are using a single x86 architecture with the help of computer virtualization technology like vSphere from VMware we may abstract from all the differences in these physical pieces of hardware right? abstract right? and uh, create a single pool of virtualized or virtual compute resources again it's like disintegrating all these physical black boxes from various vendors right, into atoms and creating a single pool of virtual compute resources The similar idea is for physical network subsystem. So as long as this physical networking hardware provides IP connectivity between uh, virtualization hosts, right? connected to this physical network we may use network hypervisors right? or net, uh, that uh, are a part of uh, network virtualization technology like NSX from VMware and again completely abstract from all these differences between different uh, between various uh, uh, networking hardware from different vendors and create something called pool of virtual network resources right. and more than this right. in a traditional data center environment we have three major subsystems right compute subsystem network subsystem and storage subsystem so here's my storage subsystem so I'm gonna use a certain uh, storage hypervisor of sort right? so in uh, VMware portfolio we are talking about vSEN storage virtualization technology and by the means of this technology we create a pool of virtual or virtualized storage resources so as a result of this complete virtualization we have three pools of virtual or virtualized resources Virtualized compute resources, virtualized network resources, virtualized storage resources. Mm. So I would say this is uh, this might be one of the main objectives of um, 
virtualization. Disintegrate everything, right? Every major data center subsystem. And get this set of pools, three pools total. End of story. So if you treat virtualization as a technology to achieve this objective, that's going to help you understand the concept of cloud as well as concept of software defined anything or everything. That's all for now.